As we go through the study of the, the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, last week, we examined the doctrine of election. And as one preacher said, the truth of God electing us is, a, is an earth-shaking, God-exalting, pride-shattering, joy-generating, assurance-infusing, faith-building, Love reigniting, hope instilling, soul humbling, Christ magnifying, life changing, missions launching truth. As we heard last week about the truth of biblical election, in order to get a biblical perspective about this truth, We must know who we are in comparison to a holy God. God is absolutely sovereign, self-sufficient, completely perfect, completely independent, completely happy, absolutely free. And he does what he pleases. On the contrary, we, as human beings, have wills, as we saw last week, enslaved to Satan. And we possess a nature that is opposed to God. And we reject Christ of our own free will. The human heart, untouched, And unrenewed by the spirit of God. Will never move a person towards the truth. Unless the spirit of God quickens him. No person can accept Christ unless his or her nature is transformed. As one writer said. It is like drinking out of a rusty cap, a cup. The water is not rusty. The cup is. No matter what kind of drink you put into the rusty cup, it will taste rusty. In the same way, our sin nature will not respond to God. This is why we need the Spirit of God to quicken, to awaken our hearts. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 reads, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And to tie into that, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 reads that faith is a gift from God. Thus, if we were to put it, we play no part in our salvation. And please do not let anyone tell you that God does his part and now you have to do your part. That's a man-centered view of salvation. If God does his part and you have to do your part, then salvation is by works. If God does 95% and you have to do 5%, then still God does not get all the glory. If God does 50% and you you do 50%, then still God doesn't get all the glory. Salvation from top to bottom is the work of God. And we should not hesitate to say that. That salvation altogether is the work of God. And we should be able to say to God, be the glory, great things he has done. And really mean it. Even when it comes to our salvation. John Stott writes, we must never think of salvation as a kind of transaction between God and us in which he contributes grace and we contribute faith. No. Both grace and faith come from God. Uh, So you may ask then, what did we contribute? 
Are we just passive? No. Well, we are, in a sense, active. What we contribute to our salvation is sin and resistance to God. So, and this is the hard part. So when Christ says, come to me and I will give you rest, we have a responsibility to come to God. But what we do not come to God because we choose to, we come to him because he chose us and he enabled us and he opened our eyes to respond to God. It's not a decision we made. If it's a decision we made, it would be like any other decision, like our decision to choose our employment and and to stay in it or to move on, like a decision to choose our spouses, to to love our spouse or not to love our spouse, uh, to leave our spouse or to move on. I mean, do you want your relationship to Christ? With Christ to be based on your, on your flimsy, wavering, selfish, motive-based decision-making process? Always prone to change? I see heads nodding. No. You see, but when the God of the universe makes a decision to choose you, then I bet nothing in this world can change that. You're safe and secure in His hands. John 10, 20, it says, nothing, nada, nothing can snatch you out of his hands. You will not lose your salvation. Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39, we read, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, Famine, nakedness, danger. Neither height nor death, nor anything else in this creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 30 reads, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This makes it very clear. God finishes what he begins. It's not like us, where you begin a project and your wife has to be after you. Honey, when are you going to finish that? Because when God begins a project, he finishes that. In fact, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 reads this. He who began a good work in you will what? Speak to me. Bring it to completion. So, whom do you look to for salvation? God. You look to God for salvation. So you may ask the question, so then how do we get saved? How do I know if I'm the elect? How do I know if I'm chosen? Well, we do not. And we will not until and unless you cry out to God in response to the proclamation of the gospel. Anyone who cries out to God in response to the gospel proclamation will be saved. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 reads, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord? And not rather that he should turn from his way and live? Do you you want to be saved? If you're not this morning, cry out to God for mercy. Cry out to him. He will open your heart. He will remove those blinders from your eyes. He will remove the hardness of your heart. He will put a new and living spirit within you. He will give you the gift of faith. And with that gift of faith, you will cry out to God for salvation. Yes. 
Let me tell you something. No one will find themselves in heaven who did not want to be in heaven. And there will be no one in hell that they so desperately wanted to be in heaven but, but, but could not because they were not chosen. Did you get that? They will find themselves in hell because that's where they want it to be. We are born again because, not because we initiate our salvation, we are born again because, praise God, he initiates it. And this is what John said, I mean, Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You see, that's why the, that, uh, this is why the doctrine of election glorifies God, humbles man. It's not about us. It's about God. The doctrine of election proves that it's impossible for man to choose God unless God has given him the gift of faith. And by the way, folks, as I said last time, this, this is tough, true, difficult truth. And please, I would love to spend time with you. Come meet with me. Spend time with me. I'm in the office. I'd love to take you out for lunch. Maybe talk about these things and wrestle through this. It's a lifelong process of learning. It doesn't finish here today. It moves on, goes on. It's a lifelong process. Let's now come to verses 5 and 3, 5 and 6 of Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 5 and 6. We see two truths in verses 5 and 6. The first one, we are adopted by God's sovereign will. Verse 5. Second, we are accepted in Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 6. Let's look at the first truth. We are adopted by God's sovereign will. Verse 5 reads, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. As I told you last week, we could take the phrase, in love, which is in verse 4, with verse 5, if you take in love with verse 4, you will see that a result of our, as a re- result of our election, we are holy and blameless before him in love. It means as a result of God choosing us, we are able to love God and others, and our desire to be holy and blameless arise because of our love for God. The second option is to take in love with verse 5. Where it goes as follows, that in love, God predestinated us. Meaning, God predestinated us. It was not arbitrary. It was not something mechanical, but as a result of his love for us. And I left it there last week. Today, I'm going to tell you which way I'm going to go. Both options are biblically possible. It's not a hill to die on. If you read commentaries, it'll give you pages and pages of technical information. As to why in love should go with verse 4. Or why in love it should go with verse 5. I'm going to take the phrase in love with verse 5. So this verse would read. God in love predestinated us unto adoption as sons. The motive behind God sovereignly choosing us is love. This is what we read in John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave us only begotten son. First John chapter 4, verse 10. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. First John 4, 19 reads, We love because he first loved us. God loved us so much that he did not leave redemption or salvation to be the responsibility 
in our hands. Because if he would have done this, we would have sabotaged it a long time ago. We would never delight in him. We would never desire him. But because of his great love, God so chose us and gave us to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see this truth in John chapter 17, verse 6. He chose us even before the foundation of the world. And this is what Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 reads. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive. So let's come back to verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. I want to look at the word predestined. But before we look at the word predestined, I want to set up uh, the situation in such a way, explain to you three words. Two of that comes in Ephesians chapter 1. The two words are chose and predestined. But there is a third word which is called foreknowledge. It's closely associated with God choosing, with predestination and election, but it's found in Romans chapter 8. So let's first look at the word choose, and I talked about it last week. The word choose is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It means to select. Like when you go to a garment store and you choose from among the many garments, you pick one. It's the same word that was used when David went uh, to the brook and chose five round stones. In the same way, God chose from the many individuals the stresses on the choice he chose. The next word I want to talk about is the word for knowledge. Talked about a little bit last week. This is a term that's used in Romans chapter 8, 28 and 29. It says, and we know that all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And then the verses go on to read, for those whom he foreknew, that's the word, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, some people will tell you, for knowledge is God looking down from above, through the window of time, through the years, and, and seeing who would believe, who would be on his side, and then choosing them, because they believed. Meaning God knew beforehand which sinner would believe, and on the basis of the information that he acquired, on the basis of this knowledge, he decided to predestine them unto salvation. Who gets the credit? God or man? Man. If, you, if that is the knowledge, if that foreknowledge is what we think. So let me explain to you what foreknowledge means in the Bible. When the Bible uses the word foreknowledge, it refers to God foreknowing individuals, not their actions. Meaning he has a special regard for individuals. That means they are the objects of his affection and concern. For example, in Amos, a book in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, Amos chapter 3 Verse 2, we read the same word that's used. God speaking to Israel says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now the Lord knew about all the families of the earth, right? God is God, is sovereign. He knows about everyone. He knows about all the nations. But the verse reads, Amos chapter 3, verse 2 reads, You only have I known. That means he's talking about an intimate knowledge a special knowledge. He's talking about their election. They were chosen. They were his chosen people whom he had set his heart upon. That's the meaning of the word for knowledge. Now, talk, having talked about chosen or knowledge, let me come to the word predestined. And that's found in the passage here today in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us, meaning destiny. Meaning we were marked out beforehand with a particular goal in mind. We were marked out to be adopted as his sons and daughters of the Most High God. So if you read verse 5, it says, God the Father predestined us to be his sons and daughters. And how did he do that? By adopting us. So what is adoption? 
God the Father, well, let me back up a little bit. Some of you probably have adopted, or maybe you are adopted. When a mom and a dad walked into an orphanage, and you see babies after babies in their cribs, and you walk through that, and your desire falls on one child. And you decide to adopt that child from among the many out there. Why? But you chose one. That's adoption, essentially. So when you think about adoption in terms of how God's adopting us, God the Father reaching down to the gutters of sin to reach up and pick up street urchins like you and me. Would you please turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 6. Ezekiel 16, verse 6. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you, In your blood, live. I said to you, in your blood, live. Now, this is what God did, but let's go a couple of verses before that. Verses 4, 5, and 6. This is our condition from which our Lord adopted us. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord, your umbilical cord was not cut. Nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to, to you out of compassion for you. But you were cast out on the open field. So it means you were just a, a baby laying in the open field without the umbilical cord not cut out with blood all over it. And you were aboard on the day you were born. No one needed you. But God, in his mercy, in his compassion, reaches down and gives you life. We were like a baby abandoned with our umbilical cord still left wallowing in our own blood. We were repulsive, but God reached down, snatched us out of the gutter, cleansed us, clothed us with his righteousness, brought us to his banqueting table where we are able to enjoy all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Adoption was rarely practiced in ancient Israel, but it was common. In ancient Rome. In Roman practice, a boy was taken from one family and put into another family. The the father had absolute power over his children. Uh, The child could not possess anything, any inheritance or gift that was willed to the child because the child became the property of the father. So to take a child from one family and to put him into another family was a very significant event. And how did adoption happen in Rome? The process was, first the son had to be released from the control of his natural father. So he would do this. To do this, the real father would sell his son twice to the adopter as a slave. And twice buy him back. And at the end of it, on the third time, he would sell the son again. And this time, the adopting father would become the new father, retaining absolute control over the boy. And the boy retained all the rights and privileges of the new family that adopted him. And in this process, all debts were considered to be fully paid. And the adopted son became a new person with a new identity to continue the line of the adopter. In the same way, God adopted us. He snatched us from the kingdom of darkness. He brought us from the kingdom of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his son. We are no longer sons of disobedience or children of wrath. All our sins are forgiven. 
Our debt to the law is fully paid. We are no longer under its penalty. We are placed into the family of God with God as our heavenly father, with new privileges, the heavenly riches in Christ Jesus. We become members of God's household, no longer having any responsibility or obligation to the land of darkness, to the kingdom of Satan. And now we belong to the new family the adopted father, God, our heavenly father, is now our adopter. And he has complete control over our lives. Unlike the earthly father who would one day die, our heavenly father would never die. And so we would always continue to be sons and daughters under his complete control. And as a result of our adoption, we are in an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. He becomes our Abba, Father. You prayed to God calling Him Abba, Father? It's a personal, endearing term. He becomes your Abba, Father. And not only does He become your Abba, Father, you become heirs of His riches in heavenly, heavenly places. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 reads this. It says, If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ... This is why the Bible says, God shall supply, my God shall supply all my riches in Christ Jesus. Not just physical riches. Don't think of a BMW and a Benz. Or, they're talking about heavenly riches and heavenly places. That's where we belong. That's where our citizenship is, right? Now, come back to verse 5, please. Ephesians 1, verse 5. And says, he predestined us for adoption... As sons, through Jesus Christ. He is the agency of our adoption. It is through the work of Christ on the cross that we are adopted into God's family. And as adopted children, we are all one in Christ Jesus. As you're looking around you and you see brothers and sisters sitting right next to you, if they're believers, they're all, what? Having one common father. God is your father. And this is why this church has got to be the place where you practice your one another's. Genuinely practicing your one another's. Genuinely loving on people, caring for people, praying for people. Why? Because you belong to one father. Your brothers and sisters. And God is your father and you were all adopted. Do you know what it means? That we were all orphans. But God in his mercy adopted you. And now you belong to his kingdom. Verse 5 goes on to read. All this. Mm -hmm, all. All. Did a study of the word Greek, all, it means all, all riches, is through what? According to the purpose of his will. That means a sovereign will, his will is independent of everything. It's not bound by a thing or a person. His will refers to his sovereignty. When he decides to adopt us as his children, it was motivated by pure love. It was his utmost delight. It was a sovereign decree that he chose those who were to be members of his body. Totally apart from any interference, any human consideration, purely on the basis of his own will. That's the first point right there. We are adopted by God's sovereign will. Let's move on to the second point, And that's found in verse 6. We are accepted in Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 6. Let's look at the phrase to the praise of his glorious grace. It's, this phrase is sustained throughout this section. If you see, it's there in verse 6, it's there in verse 12, and it's found in verse 14. As one commentator said, it's the heart and the soul of the entire epistle. Now, to, to explain to you what that means, if you read from verses 4 through 14, you see the work of the Trinity. 
in salvation. In verses 4 through 6, you see God the Father electing us, predestinating us to adoption to the praise of His glory. In verses 7 through 12, God the Son redeeming us, and at the end of it, it says, to the praise of His glory. In verses 13 and 14, God the Holy Spirit protecting our salvation again for the praise of His glory. The praise of His glory is found in verse 6, it's found in verse 12, and found in verse 7. And so you find this praise of His glory. Let's come back to verse 6. To the praise of is. Pronoun. Refers to whom? God the Father. It's all about God the Father. We are not the reason God elected us. This universe doesn't revolve around you and me. God is the center of the universe and God gets all the glory. He called us for his glory. He elected us for his glory. He chose us from the foundation of the world for his glory. He sent Jesus Christ into the world to redeem the ones he has chosen for his glory. Christ redeemed us for his glory. The Holy Spirit keeps us for his glory. It's all about the glory of God. Let's come back to verse 6. He continues to read. To the praise of his glorious grace. The word grace is the cause of our salvation. Psalm 145, verse 8, reads, The Lord is gracious. The Lord is merciful, compassionate, kind, forgiving, forbearing, tender-hearted. This is flowing from God himself. God is a gracious God. When you think of a God and you think about graciousness, God and graciousness. God is gracious. We see this in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. It says, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. You see, the nation of Israel is rebellious. But he was gracious to wait for them to come to repentance. He's gracious. Moses. I requested in Exodus chapter 33. God, show me your glory. And then you find in an intensive meeting described in Exodus chapter 34. You find the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. And he proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now I want you to listen to this. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a good, a God, merciful and gracious, he says. Slow to anger. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Here is God, here is God revealing to Moses as he descended in the cloud and stood with him there proclaiming for years. And he says, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Whenever the Lord revealed himself, he described himself as merciful and gracious. His glory was on display. And whenever his glory was on display, he displayed himself and said, Here, I'm a gracious God. Loving kindness or kesed love was his identity. He said he's a God who is gracious and merciful. I want you to follow that trend. And come into the New Testament. And as you come into the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. It says, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. Whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through whom also he created the world. Listen to this. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Here, the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. So that means, when you're thinking about Jesus being the radiance of God's glory, and God, whenever he revealed himself, he said, I'm a gracious God and a merciful God. Guess what that makes Jesus? 
gracious. He is grace. And don't we see that in John chapter 1, verse 14, where we find the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The grace of God is seen in Jesus Christ. The grace of God that we have seen in the Old Testament is a shadow or a type of the fullness of the grace found in Jesus Christ. This is why Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. I hope you are able to see the link between grace of God displayed in God the Father and the grace that appeared to us. God the Father's grace was not tangible in Old Testament times. God merely said, I'm a gracious God. But in the New Testament times, this tangible, this thing that grace and loving kindness now becomes manifested and he dwells among us as grace. That we can touch him and feel him. And know God's grace. And this grace is the glory of God. So from these verses as you read. Jesus Christ is the grace of God. And the grace of God is the glory of God. This is why the Westminster Confession states. Man's chief end is to glorify God. And how can you glorify God? Through knowing the grace of God. And the grace of God, Jesus Christ, is the glory of God. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 17, it says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3, the earth is full of his glory. Romans chapter 11 verse 36, for from him and through him and to him, are all things to him be the glory forever and ever. When you and I get a glimpse into the glorious grace, we will give all glory to God. When you and I understand that Jesus Christ is a manifestation of God's glory, and you submit to him, you are giving God glory. When you understand this, it will change the way you live, it will change the way you talk, it will change the way you pray, it will change the way you have relationship, it will change the way you think about things. It's no no longer about you, it's no longer about your feelings, it's no longer about your needs, it's no longer about your opinions, it's no longer about your kingdom, it's about God's glory. Amen? You see, it has to begin with the right understanding of God's grace. That's why I had to take you through a biblical theology of understanding what God's grace is all about into the New Testament. Without understanding God's grace, you will not know how you got to respond to God's grace. It has to begin with an understanding of God's grace. Now... Without understanding the need for grace, you will not be able to give God all the glory. You will not be able to lay down your crowns before God Almighty and sing the song, crown him with many crowns. You need to understand who you truly are to understand the grace of God. We were dead in our transgressions and sin. Spiritual corpse, unable to make a single move towards God, think rightly about God, or even respond to God, unless God first gave us life. Ephesians chapter 2 continues, not only were we spiritually dead, we were continually practicing evil. When I say continually, it's present tense, continual. We were gratifying the desires of our sinful nature. We were dead to God, alive to wickedness. We were like a zombie. The walking dead. I mean, spiritually dead people walking to do evil. Enslaved by sin. 
I mean, we want what we want and we circumvent God's law to fulfill our flesh. Like Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 26, we were taken captive by Satan to do his will. So not only are we dead, we are living in continual sin. We are enslaved to sin. We are also under the wrath of God. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, a passage, when you go home, take time to read through that. It summarizes the condition of every human heart apart from the grace of God. There's no one righteous, says Paul. There is no one who desires me. There's no one who is good. Now, from people's perspective, you probably heard this. Oh, that person is a good person. Well, from God's perspective, there's no one who is good. In fact, from God's perspective, there's no one who understands or seeks after God. From our perspective, we'll say, oh, that guy is seeking after God. Well, from God's perspective, God says, no one, nada. Romans 3, there's none that seeks after God. That's why 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Man without God's spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. Man without the spirit of God cannot understand the word of God. You may understand this as literary work, great literary work. There are professors teaching this work in secular universities. Great information. They'll teach you about the genre. They'll teach you about the, the, the work of the writers and the mind behind the writers and the synthesis and, and, the, and the syntactical understanding of But the man without the Spirit of God will not know the Word of God as the way God needs you to understand it. But here's where the thing comes. If you understand this, this is where the but comes in. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says, praise God for the buts in the Bible. And we see that in Ephesians chapter Two, but God. We see that in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God, while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is what we need to understand, my friends. In order to understand the grace of God, in order to understand the glory of God, this is what you and I need to come face to face with, that you need to understand who you are and how desperately you need this grace and how this grace saved you. But God, in spite of who we are, Christ died for you. God's love drew him to you. God foreknew you. He elected you. He, he, he drew you to himself. This is amazing grace. This is surpassing grace. This is effectual grace. This is extravagant grace. This is generous grace. This is God's glorious grace, my friends, found in Jesus Christ. Paul continues. In verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 1, he says, To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The word beloved is used in other places in the New Testament. But this is the only time in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 that the term beloved is used as a title for Jesus Christ. Jesus was God's beloved son in whom he was well pleased. I mean, we see this repeated by God the Father multiple times in the scriptures at Jesus' baptism. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased at the transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But you see, God was willing to lay aside or sacrifice this perfect relationship between him and his son, so that Christ could come to earth and go to the cross and suffer for the sins of his people. Have you wondered as to why Christ had to die for us on the cross? You may say, as one person said, well, when I have to forgive someone, all that I do is I forgive you. Why can't God just say I forgive you? Why did he have to go through this process of sending his son on the cross? Have you wondered about that? Folks, God is good. And a good God cannot overlook your sin. God is just. And a just God cannot cover up your sin. 
God is love and therefore he must hate evil. God is holy and a holy God cannot ignore your sin. God is a righteous God. A righteous God cannot sweep sin under the carpet. Justice demanded that payment be done for breaking the law of God. That's a penalty for sin and the penalty for sin had to be satisfied. And the law demanded that the blood be shed for the forgiveness of sin. And whose blood was shed on the cross? Jesus Christ. Who lived among us, lived a life that we could not live. He avoids the sin that we disobeyed. He lives a life of perfect righteousness and he goes to the cross voluntarily. Took on the penalty for our sin upon the cross and the wrath of God was poured upon on Jesus. The infinite wrath of the infinite sins of the world was poured upon Christ. Christ took the penalty for our sin, justified the ju- satisfied the justice we deserved for our sin. And now we have Christ's perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness. So when God looks at you today, he doesn't see you for who you are. He sees Christ in you if you're a believer. Not your imperfection. Not your idiosyncrasies. I mean, how interesting is that? That when you look at people, you see them for who they are, right? When you look at people, all of a sudden you remember their idiosyncrasies, the way they do certain things. But when God looks at you, he sees Christ in you, the hope of glory. And all this for the praise of his glorious grace. I want to help you understand this story a little more. You probably haven't heard this. Uh, You probably have the story of Mephibosheth. It's found in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. Matthew Bushit was the son of Jonathan. He was a grandson of Saul. Now, David and Jonathan had entered into a covenant that they would love one another, fellowship with one another, fight one another's battles, share one another's possessions. And this covenant that was made between David and Jonathan not only extended from David to Jonathan, extended from Jonathan to David and to the children and to the children after them. This is a covenant. Now when Jonathan, before he died, he had a son whose name was Mephibosheth. He was the heir to the throne because he was Saul's grandson and And Saul was the king of Israel, so automatically after Saul, Jonathan would become king. And after Jonathan, Mephibosheth would become king. But you know that the events took a turn that Saul and Jonathan were both killed in battle. And when the news reached the land, the servant who was taking care of Mephibosheth took Mephibosheth and fled. And as as she was fleeing, the boy who was five years old at that time... She dropped the boy, and he became lame. He became crippled. And the Bible goes on to say that the nurse took this boy, this crippled boy, to a place called Lodebar in the Bible. And there, Mephibosheth grew up fearing King David and basically hating King David. Now one day, and we read about the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David asked, When he became king, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? And then he goes on to say, for Jonathan's sake. So immediately Ziba, the servant of Saul, said, yes, there is a person called Mephibosheth. But the problem is he's crippled, he's lame. In other words, he's not even capable of coming into your palace you don't want even you don't want him into your palace that's essentially what it means he's despicable but david said bring him and he was brought mephibosheth was brought into david's palace and as soon as mephibosheth was brought into david's palace he fell down on his knees, and he said, please, treat me like a dog. But David said, Mephibosheth, I don't want to kill you. I want to bless you. 
I want to treat you as one of my sons. I want to restore your inheritance. I want to sit. I want you to sit with me at the table with me. I want to love you. I want to honor you. I want to bless you. And as you read the Bible, you find why did David do all this? He made it very clear. It's there in the book of Samuel. He did it for Jonathan's sake. Mephibosheth was accepted because of Jonathan, not because of Mephibosheth. What was there in Mephibosheth? Nothing. He was crippled. He was lame. By the way, he was living in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar means a forsaken land. And not only was he living in a forsaken land, not only was he lame or crippled, his name, Mephibosheth, means shame. Think about walking around and they ask you, what's your name? My name is shame. And he comes before David and he says, treat me like a dead dog. But David shows kindness all because of Jonathan. Folks, I want to take that story. Why am I accepted? Why are you accepted? Not because we are in great shape. Not because we have everything going for us. Not because we are a good person. Not because we have great talents. Not because we are fine handsome people, not because of anything in us. God accepted us for Christ's sake. Like Mephibosheth, we were living in shame. We were living in a forsaken state. We were crippled like a dead dog. But just as Mephibosheth was accepted by David for Jonathan's sake, you and I are accepted in God, in Christ, for Christ's sake. God loves me now, even though I'm imperfect, even though in my own stature there are faults and and there are failures and there are imperfections, but I'm righteous. You know why? Because when God looks at me, he sees what in me, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his son, imputed to me. How do you respond to the grace of God? Do you humble yourself and say, Jesus, here I come. Nothing in my hands I bring. Humbly do I feed, I come. If you're an unbeliever, I want you to look to the cross. Because that's where you find God's grace. God's grace hung on the cross in Christ Jesus. He's no longer there. That's the good news. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And he ascended up into heaven. And the angels who were there and told the disciples, he's going to come back the same way he went up and Christ is coming again in glory. And this is where our hope is. As believers, this is where our hope is. We look up to the heavens and say, Maranatha, Lord, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. And if you're an unbeliever, I want to show you Christ. I want to reveal Christ to you. And I want to tell you, he is merciful. He's gracious and he's good. You cry out to him based on the promise of God's will. He will hear you. And he will save you. And he will wash you. And he will cleanse you. And the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove your transgressions from him. From you. And if you're a believer... Look to the grace and let's give all the glory and all the honor to the King of Kings, immortal King, God, the Father. Everything goes to him. Father, we thank you for the opportunity given us to look into the book of Ephesians, chapter one, verses five and six. And Father, as we go through the study, may you be honored and may you be glorified through everything that we do in and through this church. Be with us as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.